Hey, toy fans! Scott Toy Guru Nightlick here, a uh, longtime toy collector and toy maker. As you know from following this channel, I've done a lot of videos about my experience in the toy industry, especially from a collector's standpoint. And one subject that has come up over and over again, and I've made a, quite a few videos on, is why there are empty pegs at retail and why this is unique to action figure collecting. It's not something you see with screwdrivers or scented candles or carrot sticks. So while I've done some videos, I recently teamed up with Dr. Matthew Drake of Duquesne University, who is also a passionate collector, but also a uh, professor in their business school. And he and I put together an abstract and a paper that we presented at the uh, POMS conference on business sustainability, responsibility, and global futures. So, thought you might get a kick out of it. An academic look at what's going on right now for all of us with empty pegs, distribution, big box stores, manufacturers, and the toy industry. Hi everyone, and thank you for watching our presentation today. We're going to be exploring the disconnect between customer buying behavior and the distribution for adult collectible action figures. My name is Matt Drake. I'm a professor in the supply chain management department at Duquesne University, and I'll present it I will be presenting today along with Scott Knightlick, who has 25 years of experience in the toy industry and is currently a toy consultant with Spectre Creative. So we're going to first talk about the characteristics of the adult collector market for action figures and then go into the distribution of the adult collector products, then look at the buying habits that adult collectors have and their preferences that may be different from those in other products and industries. Then we'll look at the disconnect between this buying behavior and the current distribution practices, and then provide some suggestions for resolving the disconnect. At this point, I'm going to get rid of our pictures here for a second uh, so that uh, we don't take up any of the text on the slides. And I'm also gonna turn it over to Scott to take it from here to talk about the characteristics of the adult collector market. All right, thanks Matt so much. And let's jump in. And a lot of you may be saying, adult collector toys, what are you talking about? Obviously, toys have been a major part of children's lives for centuries. Video games and other technology screens have replaced toys as a primary play pattern of many post-kindergarten children. Likewise, adult collectors have steadily increased their purchases of toys, especially in the action figure category. So who are adult collectors? Well, they're essentially defined as 30 to 60 year olds, middle class, and usually male. They're driven by nostalgia to fulfill the fantasy of collecting them all. Some prefer vintage toys, while others seek idealized, upgraded versions of toys they had as a child. So taking a look here, this is sort of a, a quick overview of what the adult collector looks like and what they do with their collection. It's all about display and having a room, a man cave, if you will, dedicated to their collection. So what are they collecting? Well, as I mentioned, some collect vintage toys like you have on the left side. Others collect what are thought of as idealized upgraded versions. So there you have He-Man in two form factors, the original from 1982, and then a collector version with added articulation, deco, and accessories released for the adult collector in 2009. So distribution of the action figure market. Well, with the decline of brick and mortar with, of dedicated toy retailers, things like Child's World, Children's Palace, Lionel Kitty City, all closed in the 90s, KB, Toys, FAO Schwartz closing in the 2000s, and then finally Toys R Us with bankruptcy in 2008 have left a huge void in toy distribution. Other retailers have stepped up and attempted to fill this void We've seen big box stores in particular, such as Walmart and Target, as well as specialty stores such as Walgreens, Best Buy, Kohl's, Barnes & Noble, and even GameStop. The rise of the online retailer and marketplace have also contributed. New websites, Entertainment Earth, Big Bad Toy Store, Dorkside Toys, even Amazon and eBay are large online retailers the adult collector goes to. So what... So what is the distribution 
and how does this affect? Well, often there's exclusive product offered to specific retailers. By this, we mean unique characters, unique variants of characters, or especially multi-packs only sold at one specific retailer. This is usually done in exchange for the retailer's willingness to carry the full regular product line. While this behavior is used as a bargaining chip in the, between retailer and manufacturer, it tends to frustrate the adult collector who struggles to acquire a complete collection. The opportunity for collectors to obtain unique pieces that might be produced otherwise or elsewhere is the main motivator. Manufacturers have entered the distribution business as well. Examples are Maddie Collector from Mattel, Hasbro Pulse from Hasbro, these companies have marketed directly to the adult collectors via online forums, YouTube reviewers, comic and toy conventions, and they've even offered dream items, very large, expensive items through Kickstarter-type campaigns with pre-buys. So a lot of this disconnect comes with the stocking policies at big box stores. So full store policies, meaning for any aisle, are similar sale expectations for all products regardless of the aisle. Every SKU at a big box store is typically required to sell a minimum of number of units per week. Universal aisle structure enables chains to operate as mass discount retailers and, app and have a universal policy. Each shelf location, end cap, and in aisle display in the store is treated essentially as valuable real estate. The tenant, the item being sold, must generate an expected amount of rent, revenue, or it will be evicted, delisted, and replaced by a higher performing item. This full store universal aisle structure conflicts, though, with the buying habits of the adult collector. So what are these unique buying habits? Well, one is that adult collectors will purchase a full case pack. Action figures are distributed to retailers in case assortments, consisting of anywhere from four to eight unique figures. Sometimes more than one figure might be doubled up in a case pack. Well, one adult collector will come in and buy the entire case pack all at once. Why are they doing this? Well, collector's emotional connection to the product hinges on a sense of accomplishment and acquisition. Some collectors define themselves as completionists. And the inclusion of a build-a-figure part within package necessitates the purchase of the full assortment to create an additional bonus figure. What this is is each figure coming with a limb, a head, a torso, and by buying every figure in the case pack, you've now acquired all of the pieces to make a larger bonus character. So contributing to the desire to buy the full case pack. The value of the figures on the secondary market also leads to scalping, which is why people will often come in to purchase these case packs with the hope of flipping them online for a potential profit. All right, I'm going to jump back over to Matt now, and he'll take you through some of the rationale. Thanks, Scott. So just to kind of clarify this disconnect that we have established here, um, this replenishment policy in the big box stores occurring via a master cart and case pack, regardless of the SKU, really is in conflict with the buying behavior of the adult collector. When the big box stores replenish these items in this master case pack, they're expected to satisfy demand for several weeks or months, maybe four weeks, eight weeks, etc. But when these adult collectors buy the whole case in one visit, this results in empty pegs or shelves in the toy aisle for several weeks or months, which frustrates other collectors, as well as parents and gift givers who are buying for children. So here's the, the other thing too, is that these products that 
that adult collectors are buying, they're not the only ones buying these items in a lot of cases, especially those that are available at big box retailers. Parents and gift givers may be buying for children as well, and they don't have the chance to come across these items organically in the aisle because somebody has swooped in as soon as the case was put out and purchased the entire case. And this really isn't the situation for a lot of other products in big box stores, such as hammers, toothpaste, scented candles, pretty much anything else. Maybe toilet paper uh, in the, the context of the pandemic had this sort of uh, uh, interaction, but but really not any other product. Nobody's going to go and swoop in and buy all the toothpaste uh, as soon as a case of toothpaste is put out. But that is the case for these adult collectible action figures. So here's an example of the case pack, right? So that you have uh, a whole, uh, about seven different figures here, and one of them was doubled up to make an even eight. Um, here's an example at Target of a, you know, these, these items on the peg, and then what we mean by empty pegs when somebody swoops in and buys them all. And finally, here's one of our collector brethren <laughs> swooping in and purchasing all the product off the shelf so that uh, that peg would then probably go empty for the next four to eight weeks until that product was stocked again. Uh, if you read the online forums with uh, collectors expressing their frustration, everybody thinks they have this problem solved. And many collectors think the stocking problem at retail can be solved by increasing inventory levels and storing more units in what they say is the nebulous back of the store. They think it's an infinite storage space uh, in the back. Of course, there's drawbacks, though, of increasing these inventory levels at retail. It's difficult to determine which characteristics characters will be popular and which will be what are known as peg warmers, meaning uh, items that uh, stick on the shelf for very long periods of time. Um, this is coupled with the fact that these figures are often tied to theatrical content, which also has unpredictable popularity uh, because you know, that content hasn't been out and we really don't know which characters are going to be the most popular in their action figure form. Um, further exacerbating the problem is that this is not a terribly agile process of production of these action figures. The product development process normally lasts at least a year and possibly several years uh, to get the product uh, from the design of the character uh, to the production and then ultimately to the retail shelf. So this isn't something that they can, the, these action figure manufacturers can really wait to see a lot of the demand and and then you know, uh, react quickly to get more of that product on the shelf. It, it really uh, takes a long period of time. And again, the collectors are usually a small but vocal portion of the customer base, around 20% of the per total purchasers. So once the collectors buy out all of the product, the retailers stand a very good chance of having those products. If they do stock a whole bunch of those items, uh, once the collectors have bought them out, then they're waiting for the parents and gift givers to purchase the rest. And that could load in a whole lot of excess inventory sitting around for a long period of time. Um, if you're thinking about this from an operations and supply chain perspective, this is a classic example of the news vendor scenario in practice where the retailers are trying to balance that uh, overstocking risk with the understocking risk to make the most use out of the space that they have in their stores. So there's many different ways that we could try to, to solve this disconnect. It's a very complex problem. Um, one way might be through pre-orders and, and subscription services. The manufacturers like this because they, they get guaranteed sales uh, because people have pre-committed to the item before it's even on the shelf. So you, you don't really run a whole lot of risk of having a lot of excess inventory. But because we're talking about a relatively small customer base, it may not justify having the dedicated employee or employees that are required to, ed to manage the program. Uh, one other possible solution would be to educate retail procurement and distribution personnel about adult collectors, making sure that they understand their unique buying habits and maybe encourage them to change their stocking and ordering policies. Although, again, this may not be justified by the relatively low revenue increases for the big box retailers. They may not be too interested in worrying too much about, um, you know, changing the practices just for this one type of item in one aisle of their store.
store. And finally, online distribution rather than brick and mortar. And this is, is kind of a, a no-brainer uh, way to try to match demand and supply with minimal inventory through uh, virtual centralization of the inventory to make sure that we're not putting too much of one product in one store and not enough product in the other store. You just have it all for sale online. That's a common strategy in inventory management. Um, the problem with that, though, from the adult collector perspective, which we didn't really get into because it's, you know, even more complicated than the time we had is that a lot of adult collectors are used to the thrill of the hunt. They'll go out on Saturday and Sunday mornings or even before work or after work and they'll try to go and, and find something and they get uh, a little bit of a, an endorphin rush by finding something that's rare actually in the store that you can't really do that online and it's more frustrating online where they tend to blame uh, what, what they call the bots who uh, are programmed to buy up inventory as soon as it uh, comes online and usually uh, people think that that's then used to uh, scalp the inventory after that. In addition, one other downside of online distribution is that sometimes the quality control of these figures isn't very good from the manufacturer. So um, it would be a, you know, a lot of the adult collectors like to actually look at the product and see whether or not the paint is good or the eyes are, are not crossed or that sort of thing when they actually buy the item. So even rather than just the hunt itself, they like to actually look at the item before they buy it in a lot of cases. So the current Retail distribution practices really don't satisfy the adult collector's unique needs and buying habits. Uh, manufacturers are missing an opportunity to increase revenue uh, because these products are not available where customers are wanting them. Um, and these vocal subsets of frustrated collectors can damage the brand through negative posts on social media and online forums. And manufacturers must develop effective solutions to balance these opposing interests of the customers and retail partners. So we thank you for watching our presentation and please contact us if you are interested in more details. Thanks again. I hope you enjoyed this more academic look at our hobby. There's definitely some follow-ups coming uh, soon as well as a more complete look at this that uh, Matt and I are continuing to work on. So stay tuned. Always feel free to share this video and subscribe to this channel. It helps it out a ton. Thanks for watching.